Okay, can you hear me? Good. It's a lot of extraneous noise in my background because they're um, adding an addition onto my house, putting a, a three season porch on and they're banging away on the side of the house and there's no way to insulate the house against that noise. So uh, we'll just do the best we can with it. Uh, as you can see, I did work out the audio. I thought I did. Can somebody say something? Everybody's muted. Make sure I can hear you. Good. I heard you. Excellent. I want to make sure I had all of that worked out. We've got about 20 of us in the room. Yeah, I'm still quarantined for another week. So I have no symptoms, but I can't come back to campus until next Tuesday. So give everybody a chance to get in here. Some of you may want to open up CN Connect and take a look at what I posted for this week already um, for the assignments. I noticed that the lecture links weren't working from last week. I'm assuming that that was true on your end. So I reposted them as a page instead of an external link and that seems to work better um, within it. Same links, but Apparently Canvas treats them differently and I had to repost it. Didn't like my YouTube videos that way. Okay, so today I want to hold a um, a conversation with you. I was going to try and have this last week and it's related to the, the readings from last week. And this is a reminder, if you're not keeping up with the readings in the assigned chapters, you need to go back and do those. Uh, I am pulling assignments and uh, le lecture topics from the readings. And so you get a fuller understanding of what's going on in that process. So um, one of the things I want to talk to you about, because we're doing flow charting and we're tracking processes, is that we're still getting people jumping into the meeting, um, is that what do you think the purpose is to doing this type of exercise in business? To guide new people through a task? Training, in other words. Yes. Okay. Training is a good reason to do it. What else? Make sure you do it right every time, even if you're trained. Okay. So I'm going to enter these into chat. So we're saying training. And we're also talking about um, uh, quality control, right? Okay, what else would we have? Make uh, operations more efficient. Efficient. Yes, so that actually relates directly into, so it's actually process analysis. So if you're gonna analyze a process, um, then you have to um, have some type of way that you can analyze it uh, or, or visualize it. Analysis. Okay. Uh, so, okay. Process analysis. So process analysis can take several different parts um, in your uh, analysis. So you can have what happens after each one of the events, but what, in your flow chart, what do you not take account of? 
Think about it. You're not measuring time, are you? You're, 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 you're looking at sequence, making sure the sequence is right. That's a quality control relationship to it. But in, in product efficient or, or production efficiency, you're going to be looking at time. How much time does each one of those steps cost? And are there other resources we could bring to bear to reduce the time between steps? So if we could reduce, so, you know, we've got this loop we can build uh, into for quality control, checking it. But if we increase our quality output, uh, the quality of the raw materials maybe that we have, or we, we buy a new machine that's not making as many errors, the time it takes on quality control is reduced. So your efficiency goes up from there and your time it takes to process one item. Um, there's another thing that goes on with it. So if you have a step A takes five minutes and a step B takes 10 minutes and they're linear, how can you alleviate the, um, uh, the bottleneck related to that? That's what you call it, a bottleneck. So how long does that process take? Well, it takes five minutes and then it takes 10 minutes for each item. So how can you improve? It's taking a total of 15 minutes. How can you get that down? How can you reduce the time it takes to do the uh, total process of those two steps? If, if they're <clears throat> independent of each other, you could do one while you're doing the other or do two to one, maybe. Right, so there is some overlap. <laughs> So, you know, um, you have things that are in the pipeline that are called in-process goods. So once you start working on them there, you put some amount of work into that, that process. And as it moves through the production process, it's closer and closer to being finished. And you have so many minutes or so much time into each of those products that you work to produce. So, you know, it, it, one of the ways you can do it if they, if they have to run in parallel is to find faster machines to do that. That makes sense, just real simple. Then you have to do a cost benefit of analysis to see if the, you can pay for it in the process. You know, we get more throughput. Um, if we got a lot of new orders and we're having to uh, run extra shifts to meet all of these and we're maxing out our shifts now we're maxing out our employees we've maxed out the production facility now we're beginning to talk about we need to expand again and one of these might be a new production line that's that's faster more efficient and that we can push more product through another way to do this is to find the choke points in the operation what uh, what process is the slowest and focus on that one process and improve it so you can shorten the overall timeline. Because usually what you have is you have multiple products feeding into a single process that is a choke point, takes, the lo takes a longer period of time, or you can't do them but sequentially, and it's backing things up. Um, maybe you can run more shifts on that one piece of equipment, make enough so that it runs all the time. Um, there are lots of options to be able to help you on this, but you have to be very um, intentional about this process. You can't just roll, go out and guess about it. So you chart the process. So one of the things you do is do like we're doing now, we're flow charting the process through, but that same process then you could actually assign uh, which uh, piece of equipment is being used on each one. Then you can go through and decide and, and assign how much time is being spent on each piece of equipment as you're walking through this. So that it's critical that you, you start looking for, you know, when you go into production, how you can improve the efficiency of your organization. As a manager, that's your job. Lower the cost. Now, people oftentimes think about, oh, there are only two ways to lower cost. You can you know, suppress salaries and you can buy cheaper materials, but that's not true. There's a more important way to be able to do this. And this is through efficiency. Efficiency allows you to put more things through that pipeline, going very, very fast through it so that 
Uh, it takes less hours. It takes same amount of materials, but you want quality materials so that you can get through that process faster and as, as you're walking through this. So choke point analysis is absolutely critical, but the way you start with a choke point analysis is you start with a process diagram. And sometimes organizations will have different diagrams depending upon their function. So you could actually have just a process diagram that shows the order of equipment. What's from one to the next, to the next, to the next. Oftentimes you'll run into it that a production line has its own process set up because not every, and this seems really strange to you probably, not every production line that you could have, and I've been in a company that had four different production lines and every one of them was different for the same process because they bought the equipment at different times. And one piece of equipment was 35 years old and another one was uh, 20 years old and another one was 10 years old and another one was just bought. So, cause we were getting ready to put up a new production line. And so those pieces of equipment, because there's been technology leaps um, in uh, when those pieces of equipment were purchased, we had to adjust our processes to adapt to the equipment we had. So we had a separate production um, process for each line, even though we're making the same item. Now, from quality control standpoint, that creates a challenge. Why? Why would that create a quality control issue? I would think that uh, each person in quality control, they have to know the process, the exact process they're working on. That's four different processes they have to learn and make sure that they're, they're using criteria for the right one. Right. And you have to be able to take the product. If you have an item, you have to be able to say, oh, this came off of this set of machines out of, the, and this was a chemical process, out of this chemical batch. So we could trace not all, and we want from that, we could trace who were the production guys that were working on it, who making it, what equipment it came off of, who mixed the product, who were the vendors that supplied the material that were in that batch. So we had a complete snapshot of quality control for what was in that item. And you want that type of uh, identifiability. It's not a matter of just control, but in this case, if something goes wrong with your product, and in this case, this was a safety product. So if it failed, there was huge liability on the company. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to make sure I had a very good handle on what my vendors were supplying me, uh, in each case, I could look and see if I had some product variability with those vendors and I would work with them to improve that. Um, I would look to see if we had variability among the various production lines. I might have the older machines would run more scrap and I couldn't help that. They were on their last legs or there were at some point in some maintenance cycle where we would take them offline and we would do some repairs to them, bring them back up once they got to a certain level of scrap that they were producing. Bad product. Uh, you make those types of compromises as you go along. Having zero scrap is not, wasn't an option. So the question was how much uh, scrap can we run before this line is not substantially profitable for us? And that would have to do with uh, how much capacity I've got in the rest of the plant to take up the slack when we take this one online. Because if I take a machine, a whole production line out of, out of production, at that point, uh, I've lost one of those lines. Do I have capacity to pick up all of that extra work? Or do we have to run some extra shifts so that we can build up an inventory and be able to take this machine offline afterwards? You have to make those types of choices as you're going through this. It's not easy to do. Your compromises along the way, and you've got to, as an operations manager, you have to convince people to follow you. Um, this is true any job that you have, 
But if you're making changes in an organization, if you're making changes in processes in particular, or, or uh, you're proposing changes to the processes, people are naturally resistant to change. And I always had this one golden rule of Phil Bailey was all change is painful. It doesn't matter if it's good or if it's bad, it's painful. So your job is to tell people, well, not just to tell them, but to convince them that if they're willing to pay the pain, you know, the, the penalty for this change, they will get some gain from this or the company will get a substantial gain in the process. And you have to be able to convince people as you're moving through this. So you could be a quality control guy going through this where you don't have a lot of day-to-day -day people interactions, but as soon as you start talking about uh, improvements to the system, suggested improvements, you've got to convince people to follow you. That's where you go back to what you learned in, in um, Management 301 in leadership. Leadership is the most important skill that you will need to work on as you leave Carson Newman. You will need to study it. It's a lifelong study. The techniques will change. The analysis will change. It's changed a lot in my lifetime. Um, what I learned in the mid 70s about leadership, even in high school um, and then in the college and military, all of that has evolved a little bit. And now in, in uh, when you're talking about the mix of management and leadership, uh, it's management is the management of things. People is the management, uh, leadership is the management of people. So you learn to lead people, you manage things. And uh, if you forget that and you try to manage people rather than lead people, you will become known as a very, very bad leader. They will resent you because you're treating people like objects. And that's not acceptable under any circumstance. Um, people have intrinsic human worth by the nature of their creation. They have this value that, that God has given them. And as we lead people, what we're doing is we're acknowledging that value to them. We're validating them. We're validating saying that you are worthy of my leadership, of my reaching out and convincing you to get your opinion, to get your help, to convince you that this is the right approach to take. It's always better to lead by convincing people to follow you than dictating what to do. If you dictate or if there becomes an appearance of dictation and managers get caught up in this all the time because, oh, I've got this box of things and I've got this critical deadline that I've got going on and I must get you to do this and I must get this person to do this and I must get you to do this by this date. It doesn't take into account the human in the quotient of this whole large equation. You have to go back and visit who they are. You're still responsible for those deadlines, but you still have to lead these people to convince them that you they need to change, they need to evolve, they need to improve, they need to help you improve the process or meet these deadlines that you have going on. It's absolutely critical that you become good leaders and you become a student of leadership not just at Carson Newman, but for the rest of your life. You want to be successful in business? Learn to be a good leader. That's the most important thing I can tell you. And good leadership involves caring about people, involves still acknowledging what your goals have to be. If you're running a business, you have goals that you have to meet. You're accountable for. You have to make enough money in order to pay payroll. If you don't meet payroll, are you really caring about your employees? And if you don't make payroll because you were overly mm, empathetic in a particular situation, is that truly caring about the people of the organization? Because if you don't get paid, you get very unhappy. A lot of small businesses struggle to make payroll every week or every other week or every month. It's, it's a hard thing to do to make payroll. And you, you, think, you don't think about that, but most small businesses struggle with payroll. 
because it's a cash flow issue. It's probably the largest uh, single expenditure they make um, during the course of a week or a month that, that those salaries come out. And so it becomes a big deal uh, until they get a little bit of size. And then that the, the percentage of the budget that involves payroll goes down. And so you've got enough cash flow to cover you. Um, even at Carson Newman, that becomes an issue. Um, before Carson Newman became a three semester school, before we had the summer programs and the graduate programs and all that are going on, we had money coming in in fall semester. We had money coming in in spring semester. So what do they do for those other months when they're trying to pay people? You have to plan for it, but you still got to pay people in semesters over in May. So you got to pay them in June, July, and August. That's cash outflow from the business without any income. So Carson Newman's model changed and they have now have cash coming in by teaching more classes during the summer. So they're able to manage that uh, that cash flow, it evens it out over the course of the year for Carson Newman. It doesn't matter what type of organization you're running, for-profit, not-for-profit, church, um, do, it simply does not matter. You have to manage cash flow and project management goes to a specific area of how you manage the business. You're taking a specific task that you've got a budget for and you've got to hit the dates as you're moving through this. And your question is how critical are those dates and you have to make that decision. But you can't cr kick off a large project if you don't have enough resources. And what are those resources again? Tell me what those resources are. There were three primary ones. What are they? What's the first one? The uh, uh, materials, labor. People, material labor. right? Let's see. One more. And it's major assets. So you major. got cash and people, and then your other at major asset is if you have something that is unique. So if you're on a construction site, it might be your heavy equipment or uh, specialized skilled people, for instance, like um, surveyors. Surveyors might be contractors outside or internal, and you know you might have them in on more than one project. So you have to coordinate all those resources. Um, so as you're beginning to look at your process, you begin to take in this human factor in your, uh, your project management, but you're accountable for those. So when people miss their deadlines, what do you do in a project? Can you pick up the slack or? What else could you do? I didn't. I missed Find a replacement. Right so, so what did you say? When they miss it, you do what? You either pick up the slack or find a replacement. That's an aftermath. Before you do that. Oh, before. Yeah. No. What do you do? What do you do? What's the first thing you're going to want to do? Mm -hmm. Sort of analyze the situation and readjust fire as far as how you're going to accomplish the project. Well, yeah, Good even coming. before you do that. Figure out the problem, I think. The question is why. Why did they miss the date? Okay, and you listen to them. Don't be critical of their answers. Just listen to them. Have them give you feedback. And you'll have people who routinely bully people and yell at them and work through this. And it's not that I've never yelled at people. Don't get me wrong. And there are times to yell at people, but not at this stage. You're trying to find out why something went wrong. So then you're going to go back and you're going to ask about those three resources with them. Did you, did you have enough time in the process? Did you have enough money in the process? Did you have enough other resources? Those are things that I controlled as the project manager. And if I didn't give those three resources to them appropriately, uh, then that's my fault. And then we, I have to take ownership and move back. If they didn't get it done because of something they did, they need to own it. Step up and take the chewing on. I'm going to give you about meeting my deadlines related to this, but uh, 
you still need to move forward. Accountability is not, um, account holding people accountable is not diminishing them. It hurts, accountability hurts, but it is not designed to diminish people. It is designed to improve the process. We're accountable to one another. Um, we're accountable to God. Accountability is important in our human nature. So if you don't hold them accountable, they won't be accountable. It's your job to make them accountable in this process. And they miss it. So if they just missed it because they forgot about it, what am I going to do next time? As we're getting ready for them to do something. May send a reminder. Monitor them. I'm sorry. You, uh, you can monitor them. You monitor them. You exactly do. So one of the ways to monitor people and to do it in a very, I wouldn't say sneaky way, but unobvious way is to walk around, go to the job site, say, hey, hi, I'm just here to check on everybody, see how it's going, see if there's anything I can help with, but you're observing, you are letting yourself be seen. You, they know that you're going to hold them accountable for what's going on. You're not asking for a big production when you go to these things but you go to make sure it's going along. You, you know, if you're running a construction project, you go to the construction site, look around, see what's going on, make observations. Are my reports, progress reports that I'm getting accurate about where we are in the process? I've had people lie on progress reports. I fired people over that. That's accountability. Um, I've had people um, you know, say, Hey, my crew, there's something happened on my crew. People were out sick and we couldn't do this, or we had a weather delay and we built some of this into the project so we can account for this, but you can't do this all the time. The third time, second, or th third time that happens with that same crew, you need to be talking to people about how this needs to stop because it becomes an excuse at that point, rather than a habit of excuses, rather than a habit of success. And you really want them to work independently. You don't want to be sitting around uh, monitoring people all the time, the same people. You're not their bosses. You're not their direct supervisor. That's their job. That's why they're being paid. Now you're being paid to monitor a much larger activity that's going on. And that's important for you. Okay, so your assignment this week, and I've put, um, the video was all screwed up coming out of Friday. So I made a new video. You guys aren't on the video since I did it independently. It's, uh, I posted it to this week's class or uh, section, so you have it. Um, and I, I talked about the symbols, I talked about how to do the flow chart with the requirements that'll be for this assignment. But this, this set of requirements are pretty much the basics that you will need as you get out into industry. Um, you can put a timeline on it if you want to. It's not necessary. It's interesting. Sometimes if you're going to do a timeline, I just print out the process and I literally go out and I, you know, I'll go out there with my watch or my phone and I'll time each step a couple times to see how long it takes. Write down my notes, come back, write them down and observing. Um, you can do all this while you're walking around. Um, you know, you can do it with your phone. You can take a clipboard with you. You want to look authoritative, carry a clipboard with you. Doesn't matter. You know, you just carry a couple pieces of paper or something written on top and you're walking around and people start getting nervous. Why are you writing things down about what they're doing? It's, it's really odd that psychology that's played on these. You really can see it when it happens. Um, so you take uh, project management and that's or with the, we'll come to the uh, end of the flow charting this week. We have done critical path analysis the last two weeks, three weeks, and 
Uh, now we're going forward into where we're going to actually developing a full Gantt chart and process for that. That won't happen for another week. And so what we're going to do is we're getting down to this path. You're going to come down with one large project in the end. You're going to go through and you're going to do the critical path analysis and you're going to work on the process and you're going to work on uh, each of the Gantt chart as it flows through the system. Um, that is uh, putting all those things together into one sandwich for you to consume, to understand, uh, to internalize is critical for you to move forward in, in your career. Uh, and the more you do it, the better you will get at it. The more you do flow charting, the better you get at it. Uh, the more you use the software, the better you get at it. It's a habit. You just get so you can quickly do it. And you actually begin to think in this way. Oh, that's a decision point. Boom, boom, boom. You can sketch it out uh, by hand. And I would do that. I'd go out on the floor and I would take my clipboard and I would sit there and draw by hand what I was seeing as process. And then I would take it back to my office and I would start to lay it out and I go, oh, but there are additional processes involved here and here, and I would add those in <coughs> and I would begin to connect them to other procedures that we had. So it begins to integrate all into one large thing. If you go to work for a company that's ISO 9000, they require this. It's very simple. And ISO 9000 is a very common uh, process. Also 9000 and 14,000, the environmental standards. The pr uh, procedures in the environmental standards are also documented the same way. Okay, um, go through and do, re if you haven't read last week's chapter, go back and read it, read this week's chapter. We're gonna talk about location. Location is what I'm going to talk about on Friday. How do we pick a location for a business? Um, it's absolutely critical we get an understanding of the decisions that are made to select a good place to go and work. I just had someone come in my door. So um, God, craziness going on here at the house. Um, so uh, I need you to begin to get caught up on your reading. Uh, I know we had those days where I was out and that created a series of problems. We're going to get caught up. I'm going to shorten some of this up. We'll try to get through location this week. Location includes at least a couple questions that will be um, on the next test when we decide to hold that. Uh, goodness gracious, semester is flying by. We're in week nine. So um, do the readings. Uh, on process from last week, on this week, on location, and we'll pick up on this on, on Friday, but on Wednesday, uh, I have another thing that I'm introducing you to. So uh, I will see you guys on Wednesday. Anybody have any questions for me now? A flow chart? What about we have, You said we would need like, um, at least around maybe a hundred like options or so? Six, 65 to a hundred, yeah. Okay. Because I'm gonna map out like going out to buy new clothes and you yeah. said you can have to do the back process if you use credit or debit. And then there's another operation and then I guess you'd use the in process flow, I mean uh, option. Right? The in process would be for the back end of the uh, transaction being approved or declined. Okay, yeah. Okay. So you would come out of, you'd have a process for approval of the um, process, uh, uh, pro, uh, transaction approval, and then you'd immediately get a diamond decision point coming out. Um, was tr transaction approved? Yes or no? And if it's yes, then you proceed with the transaction. If it's no, you either cancel the transaction or you go back to come up with another payment option. So you're saying it would be okay to like, get your card declined and then write that down. Oh, no, 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 no. So <laughs> this is, this is that's an a pretty awkward situation, sir. No, no, I'm not telling you get your card declined. Okay. <laughs> Don't go do that. But what I'm trying to get you to do is to go through the process and look for the decision points. 
if it were to climb, what would you do? Okay. Um, How many have had that happen? You say it's awkward. It's because it's happened. You know that it's awkward. Yeah. Okay. We've all had that happen for one reason or another. Um, I had a, 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 I was out and I was using a debit card and the debit card wouldn't work. And I'm going, there's a, there's a money in the bank, a lot of money in the bank. There's no reason this shouldn't be working. Comes out, I'd gotten a new one. I put it in my wallet and didn't take the old one out. And I was still trying to use the old one. Um, could you, there was an overlap of about a month. And so, yeah, it's awkward. And so I said, pull out a, instead of using debit card, I put out and put it on the credit card at that point. Um, cause I didn't know what was going on until I got out and could call the bank. Um, yeah. So, but I want you thinking about those processes. All right. What do you do if it's not, what if you pay in cash? How does that look different? There are people who just pay in cash still. Um, it's not a bad way to operate and manage your money. Um, especially when money is really tight. Uh, so you need to not just look at what you did. You can make a list of those things that you did. You, that's part of the initial charting, but then you need to review and see what are the other decision points in there that you may have missed or didn't anticipate or should, or, or are anticipating. For other people because you're generalizing you're going from this specific your transaction with this company to a generalized approach to customers uh transaction with this company probably a good idea to have somebody else look at it too to pick oh, yeah. What we oh, yeah. the more people who look at it as you go through will find more things and so that's, that's a big deal when you're doing this, even in real life. Any more questions? Okay, guys, I hope you have a great day and I'll see you on Wednesday. We'll be back online again. I look forward to seeing you in the classroom again one day. All right. Bye-bye.